Right. Thanks, my man. Well, hello. This is Mary. Ten years ago, I fired Mary. <laughs> but she was happy about it. Do you know why? Because Mary was someone I inherited as I joined a high-tech company. And she was a trainer. And she traveled around the world teaching these one- and two-day courses that she couldn't stand. And one day she came to me and she said, Dan, I don't want to be a trainer anymore. Can I please do something else? And I said, sure. And so she was a courseware developer. And about a year later she came to me and she says, Dan, I don't want to be this courseware developer anymore. I'm not very good at that. I said, all right, um, what do you want to be? She said, how about a project manager? I was like, okay, project manager. Let's be a project manager. And then a year later, she came to me and said, this is not working. And I said, you're right, this is not working. <laughs> so what happens? Her and I have a conversation, and I said, how about I fire you? And she's like, that'd be great. I'll get a, <laughs> I'll get a severance package, and then I can go figure out my why, if you will. I said, beautiful. So I did. I fired her, and it took her, however, another seven years, two degrees, going to Ghana, battling cancer, moving to Halifax, and figuring out that her why was being a social worker. And so she said to me, I realized and then decided that what I get paid to do needs to fit with what I know and feel to be my personal purpose. And then there's Boss. Boss is a thinker. He wants to learn, and he's like, you know what? I don't like this phone I have in my pocket. I need to do good in society. Maybe I'll create a company that creates ethical phones. It's called Fairphone. He's based in Amsterdam. And so I met him. This wonderful guy and this team of 30 people are doing all kinds of good things. So every phone they make is ethically sourced. They want to do good in society. And I'm in their offices in Amsterdam thinking, wow, there is a hive, there is a buzz, there is something happening here. And so I said, boss, what's going on? He says, the purpose of Fairphone, Dan, goes beyond being a company. All of us at Fairphone are looking at the world in a different way. So I started thinking about this stuff, like purpose. Mary had a drive, she wanted to figure out a purpose, it took a while, and Boss had purpose, and he wanted to figure out his own life, but also create and do good in society. So maybe, maybe it's the purpose effect. You see, the funny thing is when we're kids, we're told you can be whatever you want, you can find your purpose, and we have a, a great old time. We, we wanna be astronauts, we want to be firefighters, right? We want to be doctors. At least I did until I didn't like blood. <laughs> Passed out ridiculously every time I saw it. Uh, and then some of us wanted to be train conductors. Some of you might have as well. Like our friend Sam. Now Sam is six years old, and he's like, man, National Railway Museum in York are looking for a director. I'm going to apply for that job. So he says, dear Mr. Tucker, uh, I'm six. Uh, I'd like to apply for the director of uh, the National Railway Museum. I'm pretty good on my train track. I got two. I can control them. I'm awesome. <laughs> so now, however, you're the National Railway Museum. What do you do? You throw the application into the bin? You say, six-year-old, like he can run this place. Or do you make him the director of fun? Now that is a higher organizational purpose. In fact, Sam went on to say, it's the best job in the world, I love it, it's good fun. <laughs> you see, the funny thing is that we're told as kids that everything's going to be happy, and then something happens. That upside down happy face turns into an upside down frown. Now, ask yourself this, was your childhood a sham? Well, think about it, right? Think about it. The fact of the matter is that we were read books, like Good Night Moon, and Guess How Much I Love You, all about this compassion and love. We're like, ooh, okay, family loves me, that's good. Then Harold, Harold taught us to paint outside the lines. Think outside the box, be creative, be spontaneous. And then that guy, Dr. Seuss, remember him? Oh, everyone got this book, right? That's why when you uh, graduate from high school, oh, the places you'll go. <laughs> and then the granddaddy of them all, Shell, right? Silverstein. If you give, you will have purpose. Huh. Think about it. Because when we get to work, 
The exact opposite is happening these days. We're disenfranchised, we're disillusioned, we're disengaged, right? We're typing out help on our keyboards. <laughs> and then we start, you know, in our cubicles, we start asking these crazy questions. Question after question after question. For example, how did this happen? <laughs> well, I just ended for the paycheck. This is crazy. I mean, this wasn't supposed to happen. Harold told me to be creative, and they're putting me in a cubicle. And then you start thinking, like, oh, my gosh, what is really my purpose in this world? What, what, what am I here for? It's crazy. So there are some data points, really, to kind of think about here. The conference board, for example, in 1987, they say that 61% of us are satisfied in our jobs. It's pretty good. I mean, it's not great. It should be eight or nine, right? But six out of 10 people say, yeah, I'm satisfied in my role. Today, it's 47%. And you know what they said in that same report? They said widespread job dissatisfaction negatively affects employee behavior and retention, which can impact enterprise level success. Here's what I have to say to that. Well, duh. <laughs> I mean, if you're dissatisfied in your role at work, clearly there's not going to be much enterprise level benefit, is there? Now, Gallup, another firm, right? Since 2000, have told us that 87% of the planet is disengaged or not engaged at work. In North America, it's a little better. It's 70%, but nothing to write home about, right? Here's the most damning and criminal piece of data point from Gallup. 52% of us are, quote, checked out at work. We don't care. And then the last piece of horrible data, a company called Imperative and NYU got together and they went to go seek out and find if people actually had purpose in their roles at work. Guess what? Only 28% of us have the purpose mindset in our roles at work. Now there are some reasons I believe we're hitting our head against the bus <laughs> and that the organization is ultimately not really, you know, having the best of times. I'm falling off here, aren't I? There we go. So what are some of those key reasons? Well, first of all, there are far too many organizations that are fixated on profit. Yes, if you're a for-profit company, you need revenues, you need profit. But you don't need that to be the sole reason you're in existence. Second, the funny thing is that we believe that power and bureaucracy is something that we should uphold. Power and bureaucracy is not the reason you're in a leadership role to begin with, but it is creating some of those purposeless organizations. And then, of course, there are our roles. So the employee is told, told what to do, these job definitions and descriptions. You shall not be like Harold. Do not paint outside the line. And then uh, uh, some of us think, oh, we're there to climb the ladder. And all of us want to be VPs and SVPs and EVPs and anything else with a VP in it. And then there's this sense of consumerism. Oh, I need more. You know, I need to be paid more. I need to work more. I need, I need to get more, more, more. And unfortunately, from a remuneration level, as it turns out, we're actually not paying decent, living, livable wages. So remuneration is an issue. And then the, <laughs> the worst, perhaps, out of all of this is the fact that performance management, we say to people, you know what? OK, there's a bell curve. You guys over here, you're really good. Uh, you guys over here, not so good, and then everyone else falls in the middle. And we actually rate and rank people in our organizations against one another. How is this purposeful? I don't get it. But I do get that you are also culpable. You cannot rely simply on the organization and say, oh, pff, oh, I guess I'll just check out, collect the paycheck. You know, they're not giving me my purpose. No. It's up to you as well. You have to find your purpose. It's very important. So like any good TED, I have an idea worth spreading. <laughs> Perhaps you need to take charge first. The number one priority is for you to define, develop, and decide what you're about, how you're going to show up, and when you're going to do it. That's personal purpose. Number two, our organizations need a new pathway. We need a new road. I want the organization to be redefined, its purpose. 
And thirdly, if there is a balance, if there's harmony between your personal purpose and your organization's purpose, I hope that you find role purpose. And it looks like this. The purpose effect is a Venn diagram. Perhaps it's connecting the dots. Up at the top, personal. That's you, that's us. Number two is the organization, and number three is role. And together, guess what this creates? The sweet spot. And the sweet spot is for two factors. One, you, us, me, we, people. When there's an alignment, we have purpose, and thus the sweet spot. But so too the organization, whether it's for-profit, not-for-profit, or public sector, the organization can win if this occurs. So let me give you a little bit more detail. Personal purpose, first and foremost, we are always around here developing ourselves, our attributes, our likes, our dislikes. Don't stop. Michelangelo said, Ancora imparo, I am still learning. Number two, define your personal purpose. I don't want a statement, by the way. I want a declaration. Mine, we are not here to see through each other. We are here to see each other through. And then decide how you're going to show up every single day with your purpose intact. And then, you know what? An organization needs to redefine itself as well. I call it the good deeds. Those five circles in the back spell the word deeds, as it turns out. Delight your customers. Whoever you're serving, delight them. Second, create an engaged workforce. Engage your people. Three, be ethical, like Boss and Fairphone, in all you do in society. Four, deliver value, not just profit. And number five, serve all stakeholders. Customers, somewhat obviously, Business, got to make money, right? Get it. Employees, uh-huh. Community, society, the environment. And then, if there's an alignment, you get to choose how you show up every day. Job mindset, yeah, I'm just here for the paycheck. Career mindset, yep, I'm climbing the ladder. Or purpose, which is then, ultimately, this sweet spot alignment between all three of our Venn diagram pieces. So, let's take a look at this for a second in action. Future Shop, consumer goods store, sold computer equipment, stuff like that, right? Bought by Best Buy about 15 years ago, shuttered its doors in 2015. That's not the story, a thousand people lost their jobs, but the story is Ritchie Brothers, an auctioneer company, goes on LinkedIn and says, hey, why don't you come work for us? We're good neighbors. That's a higher purpose of an organization. Like Dan Price started a company a few years ago called Gravity Payments. He was looking around thinking to himself, you know what, I don't think I'm paying everyone that well. And so he decided to move every single one of employees who were making less than $70,000 a year to be making $70,000 a year. He took his salary from 1.1 million to $70,000 a year. And he said to me, interestingly, Dan, as a leader, there's a moral imperative to do the best you can for those you're leading. That is a purpose mindset. Like Coach Dean Smith of North Carolina, 36 years, he was the basketball coach. He brought Michael Jordan to fame, if you know. And you know, he had personal purpose, he created organizational purpose in that team, and he certainly had role purpose. And you know what, he had purpose from the grave, because he passed away, and he instructed his lawyer to send a letter to every single one of those basketball graduates with a $200 check which basically said, miss you, thinking about you, go have dinner on me. That is purpose from the grave. Or the Kilberger brothers, Canadians, Mark and Craig, who, as 12-year-olds, went over to Africa, as you do, right? And sort of said, wow, what is happening here? We need to help these children. So, of course, naturally, as a 12-year-old, what do you do? Well, you start a charity called Free the Children. And then as you get a little older, a little more educated, right? And you say, well, well let's, cre let's create a social enterprise where 50% of the profits can go into Free the Children. And though, if that's not enough, maybe we'll create this thing called We Day, where thousands of kids get to go into hockey arenas where we want to instill a sense of purpose in them. So they, too can create purpose in their lives. Hmm. Or Kim and Jason, 10 years, they're unclear, unsure of where they're going. They were stockbrokers, English as second language teachers. They just didn't know what they were doing. In Australia, they had a kid, their grandmother said, what are you having a kid for? You have no idea what's going on in your lives. <laughs> they said, you're right. 
So they started realizing that 50 million diapers were putting into landfills every year, which takes 500 years to decompose. And they said, stop the madness. How can we help society? Well, guess what? They created G Diapers, the world's first ethically and disposable diaper, diaper insert company, and have been doing so for 10 years now. Then there's an organization that's called TELUS, and it started to figure out its own why. It redefined its stakeholders, customers, business, team members, and community. We give where we live is their motto. Six million hours of community investment time has been donated by those team members and over $400 million. Not surprisingly, employee engagement went from 53% to 85% in a six year period. And then lastly, listen, LSTN. That's Joe and that's Bridget. They're in LA. They, for 10 years, weren't sure what they were doing either. And they saw a video of a young girl, deaf, who had these special inserts put into her ear. And she could hear for the first time. The smile was palpable. They were taken there. They said, we got to do this. And so they quit their jobs. They worked together. They created LSTN, this company that makes headphones. They're pretty cool. But you know what they also committed to? Every single one of those headphones that are sold, they commit to helping another person who's deaf hear again. That's purpose. You see, at the end of the day, ultimately, purpose fuels people. But you know what? People fuel our organizations. And from there, together, organizations and people fuel society. So I ask you today, what is your personal purpose? Are you ready to develop, define, and decide yourself? Are you ready to ask yourself, what is your organization's purpose, like these companies? Will you deliver the good deeds to society? And if everything's in alignment, ask yourself then, what is your role purpose? Are you there for the paycheck, to climb the ladder, or for purpose? It is the sweet spot that I encourage you to look for, to create. Because you know what, that sweet spot, when you find it, when you get there, there isn't any there, there. So tomorrow, when you wake up, I want you to go create your purpose effect. Thank you.